Did you know that there is no set order for teaching letters and sounds based on the research? There's nothing in the research that says which letters should be taught first versus second versus third, um, which group should be introduced earlier than others. Now, aside from the vowels, because of course the vowels have sounds that are much more difficult for either A, early learners to discern. Um, they um, are much more difficult auditorily for kids to hear, process, and um, um, discriminate between. And if you're an ELL learner, of course, vowels as well may or may not be in your language. So the vowels, of course, are kind of considered to be more difficult. Not that they shouldn't be taught first, if you have some ways to sneak them in, but certainly more difficult. But there is no discernible order for the other letters and sounds. As a matter of fact, Every letter, every sound, every day goes to the heart of what learners um, strive and thrive to be and to do on a daily basis as readers and writers in our classroom. Because you need all of the code to do anything with it. And that starts with the alphabet sounds. So if my name's Kate and I only have the T or the K, I still can't write Kate. And it is gonna be a real crapshoot lottery draw as to whether I'll be lucky or not if my named letters don't align with the scope and sequence of letter introduction that whatever teacher I may get um, ascribes to. Now, when I say every letter, every sound, every day, keep a couple things in mind. And also when I talk about individual letter sound introduction, keep a couple things in mind. I don't mean in terms of writing spotlighting letters on the board for a purpose of handwriting because that is deserving of slower um, time for processing, spotlighting, highlighting, practicing, uh, building up that fine motor capability at early grade levels. But that's different from giving access. Access is everything. Access is the key to the world. Access is, is the key to the kingdom, is access. Keys to the kingdom start with being able to access the kingdom. And to do that, you need as much as possible as soon as you can have it in completely developmentally appropriate ways. So all of this to say, if you're going through this front door or you're relying on higher level processing and you're taking individual letter sounds through repetitious practice routes, Fun practice, albeit, but still repetitious practice roots. Um, trace the letter, draw the letter, um, become the letter. If it's repetitious practice that is geared toward cognitive acquisition, it's a slow, arduous pace. It is also uh, teetering on the line of what could be considered developmentally appropriate for a pre-K and kinder. If, however, you're going through the back door, Backdoor meaning using what's already there, accessing what's already developed, not relying on areas of the brain that haven't yet fully developed. The brain develops back to front, earlier developing centers. We've got social, emotional, feeling-based networks or tattling centers, as I like to call them. The area of your brain that responds to social feedback and feelings, that area is strong and it's intact. The higher level processing center that identifies symbols and pairs that together with sounds that are in words that kids may or may not relate the connection to, that is an area that is yet to develop. When the brain develops back to front, you're, you're targeting a lot of times instruction in an area where there's no one home yet. It's not built yet. So we can knock, but they may not answer. And therein lies the struggle for teachers with trying to get these pieces of the code um, kind of down with this spoonful of sugar. The, 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 the key the the um, the special route to access is here. It's in the area that's reliable, that's already there, that's existed long before they've come to us in kindergarten. So whether you're a parent or whether you're a teacher, this back door that I'm talking about for this purpose of individual letters is muscle memory, muscle memory, body intelligence. Now, social, emotional, feeling-based networks, that is where we're gonna hit with these letters that come together and don't do what they should. But at the bare bones level base of individual alphabet sounds, what we're gonna tap into and, and, um, and kind of grab on and hold is muscle memory. It's the better alphabet song and I'm gonna be posting a video of it uh, next, actually, right after I'm done with this. I'm gonna be posting actually a session that was on Zoom for the Virginia Reading Conference, and I did a couple sessions. I did one that goes into how to access sounds letters make when they get together and don't do what they should. And the other video was, um, it was a, a, a kind of a nice um, opportunity to step back and focus more on what letters do when they do do what they should, meaning the letter sounds. A says A, and A, B says B, C says K, or S, D says D, 
or E says E eh, or E. Just individual letters doing what they do when they can't get a hold of each other and do what they shouldn't. So that is going to be posted today. Um, I'm also going to, I think, blast something out in the email. So if you follow uh, Secret Stories email blast, you will be getting that with all of the updated unlisted page links for your remote lessons. Or if you're at home, um, lessons you can share with your kids to start tossing in and feeding them not just individual letter sounds, but the secrets. Because at this point, many of the kids are past individual letter sounds and they still can't read or write anything. Because in real words, letters come together and they don't make those individual sounds. We have to fast track those individual letter sounds. If we have the way to give kids every letter, every sound, every day, using um, areas that are already strong and reliable and develop this muscle memory system, or in the case of phonics, these social emotional feeling based networks, then what we have the ability to do is fill in more and more pieces of that puzzle that, that is what a reader uses to read or a writer uses to write. The one thing teachers would all agree on is that the, the thing that we will throw away, hoarders that we are, are half, um, half their puzzles. Puzzles, just missing pieces. We don't even bother keeping them. That's the one thing all of us agree we're gonna toss is a puzzle that doesn't have all the pieces. And yet every day we expect learners to be motivated to come in and play with a half their puzzle with a, a name like Kate, but only a, a T or a K to, to, to put Kate together with or to take Kate apart with. Everything I'm gonna do in the classroom relies on me having more and more and more and more pieces of this elusive puzzle that will let me read what I love or write the story that I wanna tell. So we as teachers don't wanna, or parents, we don't wanna put ourselves in our own way and act like a traffic cop that's gonna stop and control access to skills. We don't wanna be the gatekeeper of all skills. If we can transform those skills into secrets, into stories, into social emotional understanding and experiences that are already there, things kids already know, all we're gonna do is connect what they've already got to something they've never even thought about before. And because they're gonna be dealing with it every single day, they'll have lots of opportunities to use it. So this is where I'm gonna actually be heading over the next um, couple of weeks. I'm gonna try to pop on here every day and I'm gonna try to do a little bite, what not to do when you're teaching letter sounds, what not to do when you're teaching sight words, what not to do when you're teaching phonics. And, um, and then I would love to take questions and have conversation because so many teachers have so many incredible ideas and different ways of doing things. So once you're in this mindset of using the areas of the brain that we have access to earlier on, or that struggling learners have easier um, use of, then we can play. And there's so many different ways to do things when the context of why we're doing what we're doing is set and when it's understood. And when we look at the research and we really see what it says about sequential explicit instruction, um, we can do that. We can do that while we're lining that up with the neuroscience track. Sequential can specifically mean sequential in terms of where you're headed and why how you're getting there. There is no overlay of what a sequence should be. That doesn't exist. So if we go by the brain's um, process for learning, then the sequence kind of shifts into a different realm. And that's where we're gonna head. So I am really excited. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to do no more than, I'm gonna say two minutes, but it's probably gonna be four each day. And it's what not to do, 10 things not to do when we're getting kids to read. And it will be as equally valuable for parents as it will be for teachers. And then I am excited to hear what you have to tell me about questions, problems, concerns, issues, um, any other thing that pops up that you wanna ask about or mention or even um, challenge. So I welcome it, I'm excited, and um, I was so excited I just had to get this out today. So look for that link, I'm gonna put it in the post with this um, video, or if this ends up being an IGTV story, then you will find it in the post with a screenshot that will be the latest one today that will say something about fast tracking those letter sounds. And I will be posting the one that is more specific to phonics patterns either later today or tomorrow, and all of this will come to you via email if you find the subscriber box on www.secrets stories.com and then look for an email to come later this evening. Bye. Happy Sunday. Stay safe.